Hi there, Spark fans. Rob Reynolds here. Welcome to the SparkFun Inventor's Kit version 4.1 walkthrough for Project 3. At this point, you should have already gone through the first two videos in which we cover setting up the Arduino IDE, installing drivers, and working on all the circuits of the first two projects covering light and sound. We're going to be building on all that knowledge this time around, so it's best if you're familiar with it. We're heading into what is perhaps my favorite part of the SIK, motion. If you've seen my videos, you'll know that I really enjoy taking code and converting it into motion. We're going to be working on how to make things move and also how to sense when things are moving. And then we're going to be combining all that information and making a really cool alarm with it. So let's dig in. For our first circuit in this project, we're only going to need a few components. We're going to need our old friend, the potentiometer. We'll need our servo motor. And we're going to need eight jumper wires. I said eight, not nine. And that's it. Now I want to talk about servo motors for a minute. There are a number of motors that we can use for experiments. A standard DC motor will have two wires coming out of it, one for power, one for ground. Send power to it, and it spins around endlessly until you disconnect power. A servo motor, however, has three wires. Notice on this one, there is a red, a black, and a white. The red is for power, the black is for ground, and the white is our control line. We'll be sending signals to this servo motor, and that way we can control its position, where it goes. The servo motor will usually run between about zero and 180 degrees, and we can program to what degree it turns, and we'll have it hold that position. Now, the other thing you're going to want to grab for this is your dual lock tape, because we'll want that to hold the servo down, and a pair of scissors if you have one handy. So let's put it together. So now our circuit is assembled. A couple of things I want to point out. I grabbed one of our servo hubs. You've got a number of choices. I went with the one with the long arms because it's easy to watch move and it's going to be the one that comes in handy later on in our experiments. And when you put our potentiometer in, make sure that your knob is set right about its center. It's going to be a good place for us to start when we upload our code so our servo doesn't go too crazy and swing hard to one side. So let's plug it in and take a look at the code. Once again, go down to File, Examples, SIK Guide Code Master, and now we're on 3A Servo. Open that up, and we'll take a look at a couple of things here. We've got include servo.h. That adds our servo library. The h is a header, and once you call that, it will include, as you can see here, the servo library. That will tell the program everything it needs to know about how to control your servo. You have to create an object. In this case, we're calling the servo my servo. If you had multiples, you could call it servo 1, servo 2, servo 3, whatever you want, just so you know what it is. We attach it to pin 9, and we did that when we set up our circuit. And here, in our loop, this is what's going to repeat. Pot position, or potentiometer position, equals analog read A0. So that will read the input from your potentiometer. Servo position, we're using the map function, which I don't believe we've called yet. So we take our pot position, which we know as an analog read goes from 0 to 1023. And then we're going to map that to between 20 and 160. If you recall, a servo will go from about 0 to about 180 degrees, but that could be a little extreme. You may get a little twitch on the outside. By cutting it down to 20 to 160, we'll eliminate that. And then my servo right writes the position of the servo once it's mapped down to between 20 and 160 degrees to our servo itself, and it will move it. So once again, make sure we've got our correct board and our correct port. And we will upload that code and see what happens. So let's take a look. What should happen is when we turn our potentiometer, our servo should turn. Let's test it out. And there you go. You can see how quick it responds. Now one thing you may notice as I'm turning my potentiometer clockwise, my servo is spinning counterclockwise. If that's an issue, if you need to fix that, you can simply reverse the power and ground lines to your potentiometer. 
and now your, your direction is matched. So now you know how to make your servo move with a potentiometer. But what other ways could we make it move? If we look at the coding challenges, we'll see several options there. First challenge would be to reverse the servo direction. Well, you're all clever. You've done that already. Change the range. Perhaps you only want your servo to go from 90 degrees to 180 degrees instead of 20 to 160. I bet you can figure out that too in the mapping function. And finally, swap in a different sensor. You could use the light sensor that's in the SIK um, on a previous build, I used the temperature sensor and made this. I've got a servo here, and I mapped the, the range of the temperature from the temperature sensor to the servo. Let's move on now that we know how to make something move and figure out how to sense when something's moving. Now that we know how to create motion, let's learn how to sense motion, and specifically movement. For that, we're going to be using an ultrasonic distance sensor. It senses distance using sound waves. There are a number of different types, but for this, sound is going to be great for us. And distance sensors are really cool. They can be used for obstacle avoidance, to detect speed, or to detect when something is present in the room. For this circuit, we're going to use our ultrasonic distance sensor. We'll also be using our RGB LED, as we learned with our LEDs before, we'll need 330 ohm resistors. We'll need three of those, one for each color, and eight jumper wires. So let's set it up. Now that our circuit is set up and we've remembered to put the resistors in for our LEDs, let's take a look at the code. And we'll be loading in circuit 3B, distance sensor. Let's take a look at a few things here. So our constant integer sets our pins. Our trigger pin for our ultrasonic distance sensor will be going into 11, and our echo pin will be 12. Again, our red pin, green pin, and blue pins for our RGB LED. And here we have a float. A float is different than an integer. An integer will give us whole numbers, whereas a float will allow us decimal numbers. Here we begin our serial, and we can use that for our serial monitor to watch how far our distance is. We set our trigger mode as an output and our echo pin, which we'll be receiving as an input. And again, our pin modes for our LEDs are all outputs. In our loop, our distance will be get distance. Now, where does that come from? Well, if we look down at the bottom, that is a function, float get distance. And that will figure out all the math we need to get our distance. We can take a look at the data sheet for our ultrasonic distance sensor and learn exactly how they did that. And there's a link to the data sheet in your booklet. So going back up to our loop, we can print the distance. And now we're going to look at the if statements, else if and else statement. An if statement asks a question of our microcontroller. In this case, if the distance is less than or equal to 10, then the RGB LED is going to light up red. And as you can see, red will be all the way up at 255. Green and blue will be at zero. Else if means if that's not the case, but this is. So else if 10 is less than distance and the distance is less than 20. So basically, if it's in between, then we're going to create yellow. And then our final else statement wraps it up. Else, if the object is far away, you can see our green pin will be high. We put a delay of 50 just to give it time to think, and that is the end of our loop. So let's upload that and see what happens. If you don't feel like clicking the button, if you're a keyboard shortcut kind of person, you can also use Control U or Apple U, and that will upload as well. Once the code is done uploading, your LED should turn on. Now, depending on how much clutter you have on your desk, it will depend on the color of the LED at the time. I have nothing within the range of our code, so mine is green. But if I were to take a hand and put it closer, you can see here we're getting yellow. As I get even closer, we get red. Again, what is happening here is the echo pin is outputting a sound. It's bouncing off the object. The trigger pin is receiving that sound. 
It's then taking the time that that sound took to bounce and return and calculating the distance. Now there are a few things we could do with this. Maybe you want to change the range. Maybe you don't want it to sense anything until it gets into about here, or maybe you want it to sense something way out here. You can adjust the code for that. You could also have it green here, yellow here, red here, and then if it got too close, you could have it flash red. Now you'll notice I'm getting a little bit of green red flash there without changing anything. One of the things we've seen with ultrasonic distance sensors is in a room with HVAC systems like in a school or an office with a lot of venting, which we have in the studio here, you may get some interference. If that's happening, see if you can try it someplace else and see if you get better results. In fact, I'm gonna do that right now. Yep, worked perfectly. All right, so now you know how to create motion and you know how to sense motion. Let's put them together and see what we can come up with. In this final circuit for project three, we're going to be combining things and that's where physical computing gets really exciting to me. We're going to be sensing distance using our ultrasonic distance sensor. We'll be using our RGB LED and some resistors to give us a visual indicator of what that distance measurement is. We'll also be using a buzzer. So you'll pull out your buzzer to give us an indication of when that distance goes inside a certain parameter that we've set in our code. And we'll be creating motion using our servo motor once again to make something move. So, hopefully you've not torn down the last circuit. You've still got your ultrasonic distance sensor and your RGB LED all wired up and ready to go because we're just going to be adding on to that. Grab your servo. You'll need your three jumper wires to control that. Grab your buzzer. You'll need a pair of jumper wires for that. Additionally, if you're following along with the guidebook or online, you will need a small cutout. They've used a cat cutout in the book. I'm going a different route to tell someone that they should not pass into my room. You'll also need a little bit of tape and a small piece of wire to create the mechanism from the servo motor to your preacher. I'm using a bent paper clip. Works just as well as anything else. All right, let's put this together and see what we can make of it. So now that our circuit is set up, let's take a look at all this and see what's going to happen, ideally. We've got our distance sensor. Now you have to make sure that your picture is not sitting in front of your sensor. Looks like we should be okay here. What's going to happen, you're going to measure the distance of an object. As that gets closer, you're still going to receive your visual indicator from the RGB LED. If it gets too close, we're going to have our buzzer sound an alarm and we'll have our small picture, be it a cat, be it Gandalf, be it whatever you want, move back and forth. Let's take a look at the code. So as always, up to file, down to examples, SIK guide, code master, and now we are looking at 3C motion alarm. Now there shouldn't be anything here that's new to us. It should all be familiar. We're including servo H, that is the header for the servo library. We've got our trigger and echo pins from our distance sensor our three pins for our RGB LED, our buzzer pin, our distance float. We've created our servo object. We are setting up our serial, setting up our pin modes, attaching my servo, and then we go in the loop. And this is where we simply combine everything we've done so far. We get our distance. We can print our distance and look at that in the serial monitor if we would like. We've got our analog pins. That one's red. Oh, but this code wiggles the servo and beeps the buzzer. So tone buzzer 272, that's the tone generated at the buzzer. My servo right, and we're setting that to 10 and the delay of 100. So we make that move, and then no tone cuts the sound off to our buzzer. My servo right 150 moves the servo to 150 degrees, and then we wait for one second. Else if distance is less than 10, we go to yellow. Else if distance is greater than that, we go to green. And all the rest is the same as it was before. 
So now that your code is uploaded, let's see if it does what we expect it to. As you can see, the LED is green, meaning nothing is too close to it. If we were to add some, get something closer, whoop, we've got a yellow there. And of course, that's the only indicator, we have yellow, but if someone comes within the danger zone, we get a red LED, and Gandalf shouts, wizard, you shall not pass. So here's one thing that we talked about in the code, but we did not see. The buzzer should be going off at this point, and yet there is nothing. So let's troubleshoot. We look at our code. Buzzer should be attached to pin 10. We've got it in and out. We've got a good connection on the breadboard. Our ground is solid. Our buzzer wire, aha! Our buzzer wire is an eight. Tracing wires is usually the best and first step to figuring out why something isn't working. So we'll move this over to 10 and try again. Oh, it might be too quiet for you to hear, but I can definitely hear a buzzer. Let's see if I can get closer and help you hear it. There it is. Working completely, we're sensing distance, we're creating motion, we're outputting an LED and a sound all at once. This is getting good, folks, this is getting good. Now let's think of some other things we might be able to do without really changing this up a whole lot. What if instead of keeping someone out, you wanted to welcome someone? I bet we could do that just as easily. Perhaps you have this circuit on your desk in your office or in your classroom. If you're coming in in the morning, maybe it's Monday, you're a little sleepy, wouldn't this help? You're walking, you're getting closer, and suddenly... Now that's how to be welcomed into your office in the morning. So there we go, those are the circuits for Project 3. I hope you're having fun, I hope you're starting to think of new things you can do, new projects with just the knowledge you've gained in the first three projects from the SIK. Happy hacking, friends!